Good evening, everyone. My name is Hashim Sarkis. I'm a professor of architecture and urban planning and currently the dean of the School of Architecture and Planning here at MIT. I want to extend my thanks and welcome to all of you for joining us today for the 31st Arthur Shane Memorial Lecture. 31. I would like to begin. I would like to begin tonight's lecture by honoring the space in which we gather tonight. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. The Arthur H. Shane Memorial Lecture and Exhibition Series was established in 1983 by his wife, Carol Starr Shane, and his family, friends, colleagues, and clients, many of whom are here today. Arthur Shane was an alumnus of the MIT Department of Architecture, receiving his Bachelor of Architecture degree in 1951. He went on to practice in the family firm in Boston. Last year, we gathered for this event virtually. Today, we have the honor of joining in person, and we are privileged also to be joined by family and friends of Arthur Shane, including his wife, Carol, and his daughter, Jo. We are also delighted to welcome them back to MIT, to this lecture, and to our community at large. On this momentous 31st occasion, I thought it most appropriate to reminisce on the history of this wonderful lecture by invoking the words of the late great Department of Architecture head, Jack Meyer, who, in the first Arthur Shane Memorial Lecture of 1985, noted, and I quote, Arthur had a great appreciation of fine architecture. He loved his work. At his untimely death in the fall of 1983, his family decided to establish this annual lecture in his memory. Following the announcement of the series, support came from great many and established an important endowment that permits us to bring each year one of the world's most distinguished architects to present their thoughts and works. It is a suitable memorial to Arthur's distinction and dedication to architecture. Jack Meyer's words ring true 31 lectures later. As we welcome Marlon Blackwell today, we must also remember the distinguished roster of previous Shane lecturers. These include Renzo Piano, William Pedersen, Jaime Lerner, Ada Carmi Milamidi, Sir Nicholas Grimshaw, Zaha Hadid, Adel Nodri Santos, this year's Pritzker winner, Francis Kere, our own Angelo Bucci, who's here tonight. I don't know how many times the Shane lecturer of past years attended the present Shane lecture just to name a few. It is a rare thing to have such a distinguished group of practitioners and theorists, makers and doers, join our community time and again. And we owe this to the Arthur Shane Memorial Fund and lecture series. Arthur's family members continue to dedicate their time and support to the acquisition of knowledge in the pursuit of architectural education each and every year. And they do that with a very big smile. All of them. I will now turn things over to Nicholas Dumanchot, head of the Department of Architecture, to introduce our speaker tonight, Marlon Blackwell. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you and with the Shane family. I would first like to reiterate Hashim's words on the great history and continued support of this lecture. Yeah. Project. All right. I'm going to actually take this microphone out. And I'm going to use it like this, and I think that's going to help a lot. 
Okay, fantastic. So let me begin again. Thank you, Hashim. Um, and uh, thank you all, especially the Shane family, for joining us here tonight. I would like to first begin by reiterating Hashim's words on the history and continued support of this lecture. It is a privilege to continue the legacy of this series in honor of Arthur Shane with the support of his family and friends. Welcome back. For the 31st Arthur Shane Memorial Lecture, we welcome Mar Marlon Blackwell into our community and into our discussions on architecture within the school and department. Marlon Blackwell is the Faye Jones Distinguished Professor of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas, where he worked as department head from 2009 to 2015, we were commiserating earlier, and where he continues to teach. Marlon is a practicing architect in Fayetteville, leading his own practice, Marlon Blackwell Architects. Amongst many other honors, he was a 2019 architect, architect in residence at the American Academy in Rome with her own John Oxendorf. He was inducted into the National Academy of Design in 2018, was selected as a 2014 United States Artist Ford Fellow, and was the recipient of the 2020 AIA Gold Medal. A 2005 monograph of his early work, An Architecture of the Ozarks, the work of Marlon Blackwell, was published by Princeton Architectural Press and the late, great Kevin Lippert in 2005. A new monograph titled Radical Practice will appear in 2022. Actually, very, very shortly. We're looking forward to it. Tonight, Marlon's talk, Abstract Unions, will discuss the design process through strategies that draw upon vernaculars, building typologies, and the contradictions of place. Those of us who have moved between places, both central and peripheral, have some sense of the creative tension and productivity that can result from the exchange. As I was saying to Marlon earlier, on the end of my own street growing up in Sydney was an early influential work, not least on me, by Australia's best, know, best known modernist of the vernacular, Glenn Merkitt. I'm particularly grateful to the original suggestion of my colleague Sheila Kennedy that brought Marlon into consideration for this lecture, but I was very happy also, unexpectedly, to get Glenn's strong affirmation of the importance of Blackwell's work in a recent conversation. Marlon Blackwell, the normally modest Merkitt pronounced, was, quote, a good architect and a good man. And I can think of no better introduction. Following Marlon's presentation, we will be joined by Associate Professor and Master of Architecture Program Director Brandon Clifford, who will engage in a discussion with Marlon. Brandon's dedication to challenging architect architecture's default solutions by making things that disrupt common and conventional practices invite, I think, a really important exchange between Marlon and our faculty here in the department. We will end with Q&A, facilitated by two current architecture students, McKinley Wang Zhu and Ellen Reinhardt. If you're watching online, please feel free to post questions on one of our platforms, YouTube, Facebook Live, or MIT's own webcast portal. We are here for you there. For our in-person audience members, um, we have to make things a little more awkward as a result, uh, which is to ask you to go up to one of the microphones uh, in the aisles um, so that everyone can hear your question online as well. We will answer as many questions as we possibly can. And so it's with great pleasure that I end this long but necessary introduction <laughs> and welcome Marlon Blackwell to the podium for his presentation. Thank you all. See, can you hear me? No, okay. Can maybe we could turn up the volume? Is, uh, is our friend here? To turn up the volume. How, how's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Nikolai. Thank you, Hashim. Uh, great to be back here at MIT. I'd like to say thank you to the Shane family as well for sponsoring this lecture. Uh, it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to come back to MIT. Uh, I've been back quite a few times. I first uh, taught here back in 20, what, when, now we can't say 20, it was 2001 and 2002, that's how long ago, nearly 20 years ago. It was a great opportunity to work in the graduate program. Uh, turn it up louder. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, and it's great to have the opportunity to come back, share some ideas, what we've been working on. I came here as a very young uh, teacher and a young practitioner, and the opportunity to teach and work with the great students here was really key to my own uh, personal and professional development. So uh, thank you again for sponsoring this lecture. Uh, abstract unions. Well, this lecture has some time, for some time been titled Abstract Union, and it's worthwhile to return uh, to you know, what I mean by that. And these words really encompass, I think, my approach and really help address the question of practice versus theory, of engagement versus detachment. Uh, detachment might I mean from the world, and the question of form. And quite frankly, uh, most of our work is in a place where detachment simply isn't an option, even if I wanted it to be. Ati, my partner in life and in, uh, in practice, is not able to be here today, uh, but she and I have been working together uh, for the last 30 years uh, in our place uh, in Fayetteville, in our firm. And it's a place of deep pragmatism and authenticity, uh, it's also a place of natural beauty, real natural beauty, and a place of real constructed ugliness. Uh, but I'll show a little video on that. It kind of rectifies that because that's the perception, certainly not the case. But these are both sources of inspiration and offer profound possibilities for hybridization and abstraction and a deep well of ideas that we have returned to again and again uh, in the effort to get below the surface to the underbelly of our place and really understand it in a deeper way. And abstraction uh, for us is rather than a removal from reality, is really much more the process of connecting to place and looking for possibilities of maximum meaning using an economy of means. Uh, and working in one of the poorest states in the country, that is something uh, that we're constantly faced with and how do we make architecture, how do we elevate it to the highest order that is accessible to everyone, not just to a few. And that has been a real mission and I'll, uh, I'll elaborate on that. Uh, so let me find my wonderful advancer here. Uh, so this is our office uh, in, right near the downtown square. It's a little mercantile building we bought about five or six years ago uh, and renovated a whopping budget of $69 a square foot, uh, total renovation. And it's amazing what you can do with paint and a few windows. So we just took every existing opening. And we love windows. We love elements, especially elements of spatial propositions. Uh, and uh, did a whole essay, everything from our interpretation of Secret Leverance to Marcel Brewer and more. Uh, and had a, a really delightful time. But then uh, to really give it some articulation, uh, we painted it white. And then I paid this one fellow uh, to uh, paint stripes to get a uh, pattern to the texture of the rock, uh, just to paint stripes on it. Uh, it took him four months, uh, and when he was through, he said, next time, uh, I'll call you, you don't call me, okay? So, uh, and I don't know if he's ever fully recovered from that, but it's really given ourselves a, a little bit of identity and shows you what you can do uh, with very little. And as you enter the office, uh, you're met with this existential uh, kind of symbol here, the, the bear. The bear for us is uh, really what uh, represents the challenges the, and the opportunities that you take on and how you deal with that even when they seem overwhelming. And it really came from an old personal experience as a, as a young wrestler in Colorado where we were asked one day to, rather than practice with ourselves, we were asked to wrestle a live bear, uh, not knowing that it was actually a wrestling bear that knew all the moves we did. Uh, it was a disastrous injury, I might say, for all of us. Uh, it's a long story, and I won't tell it tonight, but nonetheless, uh, it, uh, it's haunted me ever since. So that's the existentialism. Uh, but anyways, this is our office where we practice. We started, I started out in a spare bedroom, uh, just one person, and we've now evolved into a 28-person firm doing work, not only in our place, but all over the world, in, uh, embassy work, uh, as well as work uh, nationally. So I want to start with a video that we were asked to make when we uh, uh, were nominated for the Cooper Hewitt Prize uh, in 2016. And we had to find a way to communicate to people, to folks who were not just architects, that could somehow tell our story in terms of what we're about and what we're doing. It's three minutes. I just want to share it with you to kind of give you a basis of what motivates us and what we're, we're working with.
So I live, practice, teach, and build in Northwest Arkansas, uh, home of the Ozarks, uh, the home of Walmart. Uh, we like to call it the land of Bill and a billion chickens. Geographically, we're in many ways located in the middle of nowhere, but uh, you know, more and more, we feel like we're considered to be close to everywhere. Arkansas, I consider an environment of real natural beauty and simultaneously uh, one of real constructed ugliness. So abandonment, uh, erasure, nostalgia, exploitation, they're all aspects of this place. I think they sometimes contribute to that perception that uh, we're culturally and aesthetically impoverished, which is certainly in many ways right the opposite. But it is true that I live in a land of disparate conditions. It's not just a setting for our work, it's really part of our work. And I don't see it as a negative. In fact, I see it as a deep source of possibilities uh, uh, in direct engagement with the world as we're as it's given to us in the, the everyday world. And by choosing to stay for the last 24 years here, what have we been able to do is turn over the rock and discover the underbelly of our place, the visceral presences and the expressive character that really informs and sustains our efforts here. Now, I'm, I'm working from a very simple conviction that architecture is larger than the subject of architecture. So what we try to do is look at the world around us with a wide angle microscopic lens to generate ideas and actions from our direct experience with the everyday, between um, the ordinary and the extraordinary, between personal history and the history of our discipline. And what that demands of us is to be very careful observers of our place, of the, the geological, the biological, and always the, the cultural aspects of place, which has allowed us to develop a more bottom-up process that allows us to amplify the small things that manifest the large things. So in that line of thinking, we can say after uh, the great poet William Carlos Williams in his poem Patterson, is that there are no ideas but in things. And I think this, uh, as contemporary architects, really helps us address some very critical questions. One is, how do you engage the world without being consumed by it? And simultaneously, how do you enrich and dignify the experience uh, of your place for those who engage your work? I think that's something that, a set of questions we continue to deal with on a day-to-day basis. And a large part of that is because we're very interested in demonstrating that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, in any budget. So we take on all comers, all projects, from the prosaic to the honorific, from a free health clinic to the new architecture school, uh, in an attempt to use design to develop a, a culture in communities where you typically wouldn't expect to find it. I think it's safe to say that most architecture isn't very good, and most good architecture is good enough for most days. But there is some architecture, some buildings, that should rise above the everyday. In many ways, I see our task as the task of recreating strangeness, uh, of developing a connection to our place that is singular and yet simultaneously universal, simultaneously local and yet having a global presence. So, so much of what we're doing in our place has a lot to do with taking the world as it's given to you and finding ways to reinterpret it, to represent it on your terms. Uh, and very often to take what you already have and find new ways to see it uh, and new ways to speculate with it. I'm reminded of this story uh, of the Fulbright family in Fayetteville. And I'm sure you've heard of Fulbright scholarships or William J. Fulbright, the senator. Uh, his family owned a mill in Fayetteville. Uh, they used local white oak and they made farm implements, uh, ax handles, wagon wheels, plowshares, a host of implements. And post-war, they had built up an inventory. And this uh, was really disturbing because it wasn't, they weren't moving you know, these, uh, the, the product. He also had a very close friend that he grew up with, a, 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 at that time a very well-known, internationally known architect uh, who also grew up in Fayetteville. His name was Edward Durrell Stone. And he was building the first fine arts complex in the country on the campus of the University of Arkansas. So Mr. Fulbright went to Mr. Stone and he said, Ed, you're a creative person. I've got all this inventory uh, of tools and implements and I'm wondering, what do you think we could do with it uh, to, to make it to make it useful uh, 
to give it some value. So he said, well, let me think about it. And he came back in a couple, uh, a couple of weeks, and he said, look, here's what we could do. We could modify this stuff, hybridize it, and turn it into a whole line of international furniture, and then also use it to populate my new uh, uh, fine arts uh, complex. And so that's what they did. They turned wagon wheels into stools. Uh, they took uh, plow handles and turned them into these beautiful chairs. Uh, and they took really large plow shares and amended them with these legs, and they used a traditional uh, craft of Ozark basket making to make the beautiful rattan for these chairs. And so basically gave new value uh, to something that already existed, had a really great local impact. In fact, you can still see some of these chairs uh, in the fine arts complex. But what's really amazing about it is that you can go to the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, and here they are as well. So it, it goes to suggest, and, and I think demonstrate, how the local can be part of this global discourse and how you can create a productive uh, relationship, a productive tension between the two. So in effect, the new develops out of the old. The old, however, is changed in the light of the new. And very much that's what we're uh, very much after. But we're also pursuing uh, the possibilities for abstraction, for ways of interrupting uh, the way in which one perceives reality. Most folks' perception of reality is based on what they're surrounded by. Uh, we see our task in many ways is presenting alternative models of asking the question, how might it be otherwise uh, to speculate uh, and to perhaps expand that benchmark for what reality can be for the public and for those who use architecture. And in some ways, it can be uh, a very powerful force. In some ways, it can be a subversive one as well, not unlike one of my favorite paintings here, Mondrian with Cows by Willard Dixon, uh, where I le first learned about this painting is through uh, Leo Marx and Carol Burns when I was uh, teaching here. So uh, I want to share kind of that similar story here in the St. Nicholas Eastern Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arkansas. This is a congregation of Orthodox Christians that was worshiping uh, in a rundown office building in a small town of Springdale, and one of their parishioners died and left them some money, and so they bought some land on the uh, edge of the highway on the interstate, uh, and they wanted to build a new sanctuary and fellowship hall. Uh, now, the money they had left over from the purchase of the land equal to about $100 a square foot that they had available for the church, and so they brought us out to the site, and we're walking to the site, and they stopped at the shed and said, we'd like for you to turn this into our new sanctuary and fellowship hall. I said, oh, you mean like tear it down and build on the footprint. And they were like, no, 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 we only have $100 a square foot. And I'd already told them they couldn't build a Byzantine you know, brick uh, deal that they really wanted to build. And so they said, well, this is what we have. So our hearts sank a little bit because our first you know, spiritual commission, a church, and it's a welding shed. Uh, but we went back to origins, and we went back to the origins of the Greek Orthodox Church, and we thought, what could we do that wouldn't cost a lot? And as architects, I think there is one thing we really can do, and that's working with scale and proportion, because that doesn't cost anything. And so we devoted ourselves to understanding the Greek proportioning system and then reconfigured uh, this uh, whole shed uh, into this new abstract figure um, made out of local off-the-shelf uh, box rib panels uh, uh, with this sort of sacred face towards the highway uh, it has all the icons and the colors and such that the church had asked for, included a, a beautiful little canopy with a little bit of Corbusier influence in it. Actually, a direct ripoff almost from the Garsh uh, caretaker thing. But, you know, uh, I always say a uh, every architecture, all, all architecture goes better with a little bit of Corb. So, nonetheless. So, this was the church. Uh, how did we do it? Well, we literally wrapped the existing building with a new skin. It's like one of the first American double skin systems, right? And, uh, and then we added 10 feet to the front to create a narthex so that we could get on an east-west axis into the sanctuary with its movable walls for overflow into the fellowship hall. Very simple uh, program. Uh, and the other thing that we did, and we do this a lot, we take off-the-shelf systems, we took all the corner details, all the sills and the uh, eave details, and we had them made locally to create the kind of seamlessness in terms of how uh, uh, transitions are made. And this really creates a, a beautiful dialogue between the surface or the field of the surface and the edge condition. 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a seamless way. And, and then through a, uh, a strategy of coursing all elements into the, these ribs, the texture of the ribs, things disappear like that as an exit door. We had to put the concrete pad there so you know where that is. But you know, all of this is kind of integrated to, again, synthesize, to make something that really focuses on the figure and the surface rather than all these extra parts. And the interior is made out of bar stock. We cut one window in the existing building to let Eastern light in the morning where Father John uh, would perform the services. Uh, the one thing they didn't have was a dome. They wanted a dome on top, couldn't do that because of the uh, pre-engineered uh, steel structure, so, but they allowed us to put it into the plenum. Uh, we spec'd a beautiful uh, fiberglass dome, which they couldn't afford. We're in the middle of construction. We asked the contractor, can you build a dome? I don't think I can, not at the craft level you would want. I said, well, what are we gonna do? And he said, well, give, me, give me a couple days. Uh, so he comes back and he says, listen, I've got a metal worker friend of mine in the mountains about 20 miles away. Uh, he really loves beer. Uh, and he said, for a couple cases of beer, we can get a satellite dish that he has. Uh, and we just skim coat it in, in plaster, because it's its own natural lath, jacked it up on a scissor lift, and that's how we roll. We got our dome. So, uh, and, you know, that's how we roll. I told Father John, you know, you have a direct connection to God now. Uh, and then he reminded me uh, that it was pointed in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> and, and then we had one of the building committee mem members, you know, approach me and says, I'm just, I just love this idea of reusing things. I, I can get us a big uh, wooden uh, throne uh, for the bishop when he comes to uh, bless the, the church. And it's, it's walnut, and it's got crushed purple velvet upholstery, and I can get it for free. And I said, where? And he goes, well, it's part of an ad campaign at the local liquor store. But they said I could have it afterwards. I said, well, okay. He said, I just don't know what we're going to do with the embroidered CR on it. I was like, oh, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, uh, Crown Royal. I was like, oh, yeah. And then Father John walked over. He'd overheard us. He said, no, Christ the Redeemer. Get, get the chair. <laughs> so that, that's how we roll. So in 2013, we, were, we were, uh, got a phone call from the, uh, the National Honor Awards Committee of the uh, AIA Institute and, uh, to tell us that this had won a National Honor Award, which we were very excited about. But they said we were really impressed with uh, the budget for this. And so we did some research, and we've discovered that this is the least expensive building to ever win a National Honor Award. And so it just underscored what we've been trying to do here, which is to demonstrate that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, at any budget, and for anyone. And so that's been part of our mission, working between the ideal and the improvised uh, in our discipline. And not saying one is a positive or negative, but trying to find resonance between these conditions to embrace the world in many ways as it's given to us, but simultaneously to be careful observers, to look for the patterns that connect between what is nature made and what is culture made for sources of inspiration. And we have multiple examples I can show you. This is just one at the Indianapolis Museum's uh, Ruth Lilly Pavilion, uh, set in the 100 Acre Art and Nature Park, where we took leaves that we had found on site. Uh, they did eaten away by insects, but the structure of the leaf left in place. And that became the analog for the development of this beautiful exoskeleton uh, and canopy skin, uh, working with Guy Nordenson on this. And, and it really, uh, it's fantastic, you really don't see the structure, but the shadow of the structure, and it pulsates uh, as the clouds and the sun move over the course of the day and really comes alive. It's kind of one of those things imbued with the order of change. But looking at the everyday is really uh, something important to us because this becomes, like I say, uh, it is the reality, the context, no matter where you're at. And so we found ways to, uh, you know, through contour and cutting operations, to resituate uh, these forms with new program, new sites, and really create a condition that we, we like to call the strangely familiar. And it is that production, the productive tension between the local and the universal that we're really uh, after. When I was uh, uh, growing up, I had dreams of being a cartoonist. Uh, I cartooned, I think, almost all my life, all the way up through college. Uh, but before I got to college, I, uh, I had a change of heart. I knew I had to get a uh, you know, a real job. My parents said, you got to be in a profession. So I went into architecture instead. But I have always kind of worked in a very reductive manner in profile, silhouette, and visage. Section is the operative convention that uh, I love. I think of architecture as visages, as animated kind of creatures in some ways. Um, and 
using the minimal strokes that I can make to maximize the expressive character. A lot of that you find already. I mean, you see it in the barns and the sheds and the silos, the vernacular uh, of, of, our, of our place. And this is the condition that we're really faced with in many ways, rural conditions on the edge of town that are being annexed uh, and suburbanized. We, we call it ruburbia. Uh, and it's a big part of, of my context in Northwest Arkansas. We had been approached uh, by uh, a doctor who was working in a kind of not a great condition, a pediatrician who wanted a new identity for his building, something iconic that would be recognized by the children as they approach it as something positive rather than negative. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at suburbia, which in, in many ways is, uh, you think about our buildings with probably 20 different moves that they don't need, probably 20 different materials that they don't need. You know, our, our, our question was, how do we embrace that at one level, and then simultaneously, how do we submit a critique. So we came up with the idea of a building with only one form, uh, one material, and two colors. And we thought we'd see what would happen. So this is the Harvey Pediatric Clinic. Uh, and this is the south-facing uh, facade. Uh, and it's uh, what we like to call a, an abstract figure in a landscape of unholy unions. Um, and again, using our, 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 our kind of uh, uh, box rib metal system, uh, there are no windows because you couldn't punch windows into patients' rooms due to HIPAA. So we skylight all of the patient rooms and the nurses' stations, and it gives us this beautiful silhouette uh, and sitting in the land of beige here um, and as it kind of emerges from that. You're, it's designed to be approached by the car as well as by bikers and pedestrians. So passing by this building from the south at 40 miles an hour, this is, uh, you see this uh, figure in a cayenne red. The staff picked the color. Uh, we gave them blue, silver, uh, green, and they, they really loved uh, the red. This is all custom colors, so we've been working a lot uh, with uh, 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 Sherwin-Williams on how to customize. Uh, if you use a lot of metal, you don't have to worry about it too much. But as you pass by the uh, eastern Brisolet uh, and then pop by on the north side, uh, the building changes all in color. It's kind of got a split personality. Uh, and it's really seeing itself as a kind of suburban billboard uh, in, in set into this context. And then we introduced new landscapes with indigenous grasses. These are all bioswales that manage the water from the parking and such. Uh, you can drive underneath it. It has its own port cashier to drop off the patients here out of the, uh, the heat and out of the, uh, the rain when it does that. And you're brought in, uh, oops, excuse me, um, yeah, to the lobby here and the children, we light the top of it with the blue glass, a skylight that gives us ephemeral blue color that the uh, patients, the kids, and the parents move up. Uh, then as they uh, get to the top here, uh, this is a very serene waiting room. We worked very well with the staff to create a very uh, efficient functional use of uh, circulation where patient and staff have controlled overlaps. So this really calmed everything down. It's usually chaos when you go into a pediatric clinic. If anybody has kids, this is almost zen like And then, like I said, a, a little bit of humanity and dignity in the patient rooms with uh, skylit uh, uh, rooms and the warmth of the light uh, throughout the day and also in the, in the, in the uh, nurses area. So it's really become a very uh, useful building for the doctor, a new identity, uh, a, a new uh, dignified place for work for the staff and for the doctors there as well as for the patients that are, that are coming. It's also earned its nickname in the community as the WTF building, uh, but uh, <laughs> we like that too. So what we're really talking about, if you think about the transformation story, is a transformation of a landscape, right? Uh, that was rural, became uh, reverberized, and now perhaps there's another species of suburban architecture that has emerged. Um, so in that similar spirit, we were asked to transform another landscape in Memphis. This is the largest urban park in America, it's a 4,500 acre park that we worked with with James Corner in field operations. Uh, this uh, a park uh, actually is uh, the center of the park, about 200 acres called Heart of the Park, has uh, up seven structures that we were asked to come in and bring uh, 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 together around this expanded lake, uh, working with the landscapes and the placement uh, with the corner. Uh, this uh, park has a very sort of checkered history. Uh, in its, its own right. Uh, it's only been a public park since the 70s, and it's always been kind of 
running in the red. It doesn't really, didn't really at the time reflect the, the socioeconomic diversity and the racial diversity uh, of the audience, the folks that came here. They wanted to change that. They wanted to uh, produce new programs and activities and forms of revenue. The reason it's had kind of a stigma to it was it's located on the east side of Memphis. Of course, Memphis, the birthplace of rock and roll. Well, at the same time that was happening, this was a penal farm. Uh, and this is where uh, prisoners worked the land and uh, crops, cotton, and as well as uh, blue ribbon cattle and such. And that's how they sustained themselves. But then whatever they had left over, they sold off to the county. And of course, in the 70s, that no longer became a uh, acceptable form of rehabilita uh, uh, rehabilitation. So it was turned back over to the county who had to manage it, which was very difficult. So developers came in to speculate to build tract homes. And the local citizens around there rose up and said, no, don't do this. This is a really natural wonder. Uh, and you know this could be saved. It could become a park. So that was the birth of uh, Shelby Farms. And then the identity was really focused on in the heart of the park here, where we located uh, these uh, different programs. One of the observations we made is that it was primarily uh, pasture around the park. That's what it had been. Uh, but what we noticed when we visited is that wherever there was shade, there were people. No shade, no people. And so we realized that the buildings sitting out in the open pasture would have to generate their own shade. And these liminal zones that would be uh, captured by the shade could also be programmed, perhaps be uh, expanded forms of revenue for these different uh, structures. Uh, one is a visitor center. We had boat boathouse, uh, lakeside pavilions that we call the crickets, uh, the event stage uh, for all kinds of performances, as well as a, a large uh, restaurant event center uh, as well. So the first building, the visitor center, which is really the nerve uh, center of the, the whole park, is an 8,000 square foot building with an 8,000 square foot porch. Uh, so we initially worked with uh, Guy Nordenson again, uh, just, and we developed a form of cladding using just local aluminum bar grate that you typically walk on. It's kind of an agricultural deal. We figured out how to use the ties to connect to a substructure uh, that would create a nice paneling system, uh, very light and very economical. Second growth cypress, series of breezeways or dog trots, we like to call them down south, uh, that create cooling breezes uh, and this extended threshold into the landscape. And as you come up underneath this 32-foot cantilever uh, that keeps this whole uh, south part of the building in shade. But of course, shade in the south is you can still sweat like crazy. So we ventilate that shade like nature does, and we ventilate it with tw uh, five 20-foot big-ass fans. Uh, and that's the trade name for it. But uh, nonetheless, this keeps it cool and actually use it for yogas, uh, for receptions, for a variety of activities that really expand the revenue. And the beauty of the skin is that it has this permeability to it, this translucency and also transparency. And also is one of those uh, materials that allows uh, the figure to to change uh, in its presence over time, uh, especially in the presence of the changing uh, light. And it's really uh, quite, quite fantastic uh, uh, at different times of the day. And beautifully situated, I might add, by uh, the way in which uh, Corner contoured the land as well to create complementary uh, sections. And so the, the crickets, the picnic pavilions, which are, uh, are rented out months in advance, they're really popular for family reunions and stuff. They're great places for shade, but just really for socializing. Together, we have the boat uh, kiosk. And you can see it's a very reduced uh, palette of materials, just the aluminum bar grate uh, as cladding with the zinc-like metal panels uh, and, and then some, some wood uh, where we needed it. And then another figure. So as you can see, this is a family of figures sharing a vocabulary uh, together uh, set into the landscape. This is important. Uh, we're working in places where there's more space than form, right? So most of the work we're dealing with is, is in contention with the horizon, right? And you, it's designed in the round, okay? So it's decidedly not urban for the most part. But nonetheless, you have to solve all of the aspects of it, not just one facade. It's a shade pavilion when it's not being used for boat activities or for the event lawn. And then the other building, the uh, restaurant convention center or a conference center here, uh, very active with weddings and all kinds of groups and organizations using it. Uh, it also has a great restaurant, an initial restaurant. We were working with Kimball Musk, who, uh, Elon Musk's brother, who has a whole set of restaurants called The Kitchen. They're farm-to-table kitchens based in Boulder. This is their first ground up. 
uh, and it's really defined by its 80 foot deep porch, uh, which uh, has really more seating outside than it does inside. That faces west, so it's a, a low slung porch all across the, uh, that western face that really sets up these beautiful uh, sunsets and uh, 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 dining uh, along the lake. And you can begin to see the lights turning on. It really gets a lot of use, not only during the day, but even after the sun sets. Uh, since it's opened, the attendance there has gone up by 50%. Uh, the diversity aspect, over 100%. Uh, they're in the black for the first time uh, uh, in terms of revenue, and it's really become a, a much more dynamic and active place uh, for the city. So there are, uh, there are building types that we've always been interested, Ati and I, and, and, and ask our question, you know, why is this building type somewhat impoverished? How can we inject it with some... Uh, inspiration and, and thinking and educational uh, buildings has been a big part of our thinking in that way as long along with healthcare that we're just getting into. So uh, we were asked to come into another uh, a landscape, a campus uh, designed by O'Neill Ford uh, in North Dallas. Uh, it's a school by the name of Lamplighter School that was founded by the founders of Texas Instruments. And they have an open, uh, I would say, project-based curriculum for kindergarten to fourth grade. And they have an amazing curriculum, and it's all about making. Uh, and so they wanted a new innovation lab that would reflect the ways in which they teach something 21st century. They hadn't built a building on the campus in over uh, 40 years. And so the campus was really representative of the 70s, this sort of uh, shed architecture that uh, uh, O'Neill Ford was doing along with Frank Welch had been added on to a little bit. So we were asked to come in and do a series of interventions, but the biggest one being the innovation lab, which we placed, we extended the uh, ring road of the campus to make more land available to us, and then we uh, placed it towards the center of campus, which is the big play area for the, for the kids, uh, and then used it to connect all the pathways, uh, uh, you know, major pathways in the campus, and those connections really become porches, so it acts as a conduit from moving through the campus and actually the classroom, so it really flows quite lovely. Use one material, primarily copper, copper that we could roll on site uh, for the roof as well as for the cladding. Uh, really uh, timeless material, uh, works, uh, you know, patinas quite well, very low maintenance. Uh, and then uh, using uh, the, the second growth cypress wood. So it's a one-story building as many of our educational facilities are, so we're always thinking, uh, as I said earlier, about section and how we develop variety and dissimilarity in the spaces. Very often when you go into schools, there is a kind of numbing instrumentality in this sort of systemic the way they work. Equality means everybody gets the same bad stuff. Uh, so what, what we're working for is a kind of equity where you know, the spaces are resonant with each other, but they're scaled to their program. They're, they're, they have their own identity, and so as a student moves from one grade to another, whatever, they come into a new place, not you know, it's not like Groundhog Day where they, oh, I've, I've already been here. Um, so at the inside, it's reflected of this folding. I should put, put it back, explain that the sort of uh, pitch and roll of the roof to create this sort of uh, sectional manipulation. Uh, and then on the inside, the scaling. So uh, again, using second growth cypress, very careful, uh, controlled light brought in. So we have lots of uh, surface to work with. You're looking at four different uh, classrooms right here at this moment. So on your left, a teaching kitchen, a projects lab, the robotics lab, and on your right, the environmental science. So lots of transparency, lots of control. Uh, and uh, you, you can have one staff member actually uh, able to kind of control all of that. And, and then just using pine boards, letting them run wild to create texture and pattern on the perimeter walls, and great for uh, hanging stuff. And then this is the, the extended entry. Uh, and like I said earlier, elements for our, us are spatial propositions, so the idea that you can sit in a window, uh, that you can occupy a door as a transition, that's spatial, uh, things like that are very important to us. Uh, and so these are spaces uh, for solitude, but as well as for discovery, uh, so in a way to create uh, some notion of thickness in a world uh, that's quite thin and shallow when you think about it architecturally. And, so, and then these manifest themselves uh, as, and on your right, as you see, as the kind of emergent forms that are part of the vocabulary, rather than additive windows or punch windows, they emerge. Um, and you can begin to see the scale here uh, of, that this provides for the different classrooms and their related porches, right? These sort of liminal zones 
uh, the one you just see for the environmental science, and then the larger natural sciences, and it's sort of a grand classroom along with its grand porch. So it's, uh, uh, it's the first phase of uh, several phases that we're working on, uh, but it's our way to kind of interrogate about how to invigorate the typology of the educational building. And so we just finished a project uh, in Detroit for the Kresge Foundation uh, who rescued a African-American liberal arts college by the name of Marygrove College. It's in Six Mile in Detroit, part of the Marygrove community and the Fitzpatrick community. And it's a campus that was liberal arts that had a grad, undergrad and grad and started losing enrollment, got in financial difficulty. And so it was essentially closed. What Kresge did is came in and decided to make a cradle to career campus. So from prenatal to 20 years old, uh, to set uh, students up in the community for lifelong learning, uh, as well as for opportunities uh, in, uh, beyond uh, either uh, in the workforce or, or, or uh, in, the, uh, in the academy. So it's a building, too, a one-story building, 20,000 square feet, that anchors this uh, collegiate Gothic uh, uh, campus here, a mat building. Uh, this the existing building is a lovely campus, all made out of uh, uh, limestone, local limestone. Um, and this mat building, we begin to think about how we would articulate uh, essentially a big box. And so our folding and uh, rolling to create sectional difference was important, but also a series of courtyards to bring light in and places for controlled play uh, were uh, critical. And then working with Margie Ruddick, a landscape architect, to develop areas of play in a beautiful grove of trees to the south, uh, and really becomes a whole new environment, uh, a place of a great uh, aspiration uh, and learning, not just for uh, the students, but also as a community center uh, for uh, the families uh, that live here as well. Uh, and so there was a strong desire by uh, the Kresge Foundation and the child provider to have resiliency in the materials, to be as substantive and durable as that of the limestone. So rather than go with the metal that we've been using or brick or something like that, uh, we came upon a material uh, of glazed terracotta panels, rib panels uh, that we could use. But we were challenged immediately when we put out the monochromatic uh, things roll out colors or whatever, or brick, copper. They were like, no, no, no. Uh, from the community input, there was a desire for color and polychroma. We're talking about, in many ways, southern culture that has moved up into the Detroit uh, through the Great Migration. Uh, and uh, Wendy L. Jackson, the vice director of uh, Kresge, was very pointed about this. Uh, color is important to us. It speaks to inclusivity and diversity. Uh, and so we were challenged because when color migrates out of architecture to the outside, for most of us, it's terrifying. Uh, and uh, so what to do? But we found something in common, Wendy and I, because she talked about it, uh, these multiple colors. And I said, oh, so the building would be clad like in a coat of many colors. And I'm thinking of a Dolly Parton song, you know, that talks about dignity and poverty and, and all this, you know, being a person and if you don't, when you don't have much. And, uh, she goes, well, yes, but I was also thinking about like a quilt, where the quilt ladies of G's Bin in Alabama, where they take discarded rags and stitch them together and make beautiful artifacts that are useful and that are literally works of art. You can find them in MoMA. And I said, well, I've been there because I go to the Rural Studio a good bit and it's nearby. And I've met Miss Petway and her quilt co-op. And so uh, this was a, a, a visit at, during the time we were designing this. Uh, and so we got to thinking about those quilts and coming up with a variety of colors that we could use as base colors for the building to connect with the context, but also to uh, uh, you know, uh, have this sort of polychroma, but also be able to afford it. The more colors, the more money. So we had to, there were limits. And so this begins to uh, become the, the sort of outcome of that, just using a few accent colors and a series of shades that work with the limestone that work uh, with this idea of the stitching and patchwork, not a weaving, but a patchwork. And then using the way in which we capture light to create that patchwork, uh, to capture light from the side, from above, or uh, from the front. And again, through spatial uh, figures 
uh, that emerge from the surface. This is the administration that has control over who comes and goes. Uh, and then the gentle entry that folds in, and then you're confronted with the courtyards here, again, that extend the space of the interior and create this uh, wonderful dialogue between inside and outside, places to, again, socialize, play, uh, places for reflection uh, and solitude, even. This is the staff uh, courtyard. And these courtyards kind of organize all the circulation, but yet every classroom has a connection to nature, a direct connection to natural light and to nature and to play. Uh, very important to the articulation of the space is here, but also important uh, is the, uh, uh, the community rooms with uh, light brought in for, from above here, and uh, those are, are, they have lounges for parents, so they don't just drop off their kids, they are actually uh, can be, stay here and they can watch their kids and they can interact and interact with each other. So it really becomes a, a meeting place of the community. You begin to see how that works up on the roof, these different uh, lanterns, and then opening up of the courtyard here uh, on the, uh, on the uh, south end, and lets it bleed into the landscape uh, that can be controlled as well for, for play into this beautiful grove with a variety of uh, activities and, and programs that were designed uh, by Margie Ruddick. So a really uh, vital place uh, that is a big component, a cornerstone to the revitalization of this campus and what it can contribute uh, uh, to uh, the ongoing renaissance, you might say, uh, of Detroit itself. Not only as a local model, but as a national uh, child care provider model for early childhood learning uh, here. So very excited, just opened in October, and I, I think you're know, only about the third folks I've shared this with, but uh, we're re really, really excited about it. So this notion I talked about earlier about the prosaic and how it can be ennobled in some ways extends uh, not just to program types or building types, uh, not just to building systems, but also to materials. Uh, very often we're, we're faced with uh, what can we use with what we uh, can find you know, already. We were asked to do a ramen bar in a, in a food co-op around a culinary school that used to be a craft cheese plant uh, in Bentonville. And uh, they were very specific that they uh, really challenged us to how do you make form from food? And ramen being workers' food, you know, I, I know everybody in here has lived off of ramen. If you're a college student, you know what ramen is. But there's also really good ramen, too. Um, and the textures and the ingredients and the, the, the variety of, uh, you know, palate, you know, uh, uh, sensations that you can get from this really inspired us to, to make something that was hearty and, and you know, kind of uh, uh, every day. So we just decided to, we will just make the entire thing, again, out of this one material, one detail idea we often have, out of plywood that you could get at Home Depot, still with the mill stamps and such, but to uh, stack that plywood, to laminate that plywood through a series of uh, 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 bridges between the construction. So you layer it, and those become spaces for light, ways to uh, cover up the infrastructure, like ducts and sprinklers and sort of thing, and then concrete block just providing a little shift in the coursing of that to provide texture. So textures and patterns become very clear. And there's a legibility uh, we wanted to provide, much like the food itself and, and how that could be mixed together. Uh, and then the real uh, coup de grace, I think, in many ways, is creating an ambiguous uh, understanding of the plywood itself by simply painting the edges, by removing visually the plies with black paint on the edge for the coffered ceiling up above and for the laminated walls or layered walls uh, white on those edges. And so it really didn't matter what kind of wood it was. With, you know, it's usually the cheapest wood in a plywood like this. Uh, it just had the warmth of wood and the texture, and that was what we were after. And we used 90 sheets of plywood. Uh, we just uh, you know, used it where there was very little waste to make these boxes, these coffers, and then about four different patterns and then assemble that into a system. It's also acoustical shroud for the space, works really well, and then is a great light reflector uh, for, the, uh, for the space uh, as well. And so just a kind of very reductive uh, approach to the system uh, that allows it to do more than just one thing. So here, one plus one equals five. And that's how you, I think you can create a real value proposition. Uh, it's been uh, a big success, and, and IT, uh, has, who runs our interiors as well, uh, really gave vision to 
all of this is a, a series of caves and spaces in this beautiful custom furniture made out of local white oak. So the idea of ennobling the prosaic is something we're engaged in right now uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we, in Detroit, we met a young developer by the name of Philip Kafka. I think he was doing some pretty great things about how to develop in a place of emptiness uh, like Detroit is and how to leverage that through public space and the development of collateral economies. Um, and he uses the Quonset as a system. And most of the time you see the Quonset as a kind of one-off. Uh, this is a, a kind of came out of the World War II, if you think about it. It's actually in Rhode Island where it was invented, this corrugated metal that's both structure and cladding. Uh, and you see it as a one-off in the landscape, in a kind of very humble, uh, a modest thing, kind of an oddity in the landscape very often. Uh, Philip has become how to use these in uh, sort of neighborhoods where there isn't anything, anybody living, and introducing us as a kind of uh, a housing uh, and kind of getting them, collecting them together. So we're doing a mixed-use uh, program for him in Fort Worth, housing, offices, uh, a restaurant, a grab-and-go, and a gallery with a plaza, a public plaza given back to the public as a private development uh, designed by Julie Bargman of Dirt. And so uh, in this case, we're serializing these 20-foot wide huts. These are uh, story-and-a-half uh, studio uh, apartments, or not studio, but one-bedroom apartments here, and then down below on their base are offices. You see the plaza, and then on the street edge, uh, what we have are the restaurant and the grab-and-grow. They make the street. And uh, we're using it as a whole system. So it's structure and cladding uh, in the huts, but then we flip it on its edge to make it part of the vocabulary and turn it into cladding. Uh, all of this is made by Steelmaster up, uh, up, in, up in Canada. And here you can begin to see uh, how that all comes together around the public space. Uh, and, you know, we were reminded, too, of the beautiful museum that's a mile and a half away, uh, the Kimball Art Museum by Louis Kahn. And we learned, and I hope this is right, Mark, that uh, he was actually inspired by the stockyards, the, these barrel uh, stockyards that are right there in Fort Worth as well. And in his own way, he ennobled uh, these forms, these everyday forms, these vernacular forms, and elevated that to the status of architecture in the fullest sense of the word. We're attempting to do the same thing, although in a very much more modest way, but trying to find ways for this system to have a role to play, not just as a one-off in the countryside, but perhaps as a series of urban figures uh, that can contribute to the fabric of the city. And it's currently uh, under construction. Uh, each hut goes up in one day once you have the base built. Uh, and we're really excited about the form that it's taking, and then, of course, how we're developing uh, the edge. Flipping on its side actually proves to be more complex than you would think. You think it's just dumb, you flip it on its side, but there's a whole host of issues of how you begin to make openings and make transition details. But we're working through that uh, uh, right now uh, to create this kind of new architecture for horizontal Quonset, if you can think of it that way. And also thinking about how, uh, thinking about contour, but also about cut, how we can make a series of figures uh, uh, of these uh, you know, using the same system, so hybridizing or modifying it. And this will be completed, uh, I believe, in uh, midsummer, summer uh, sometime. So pretty excited about how that's coming, uh, coming along. So the culture of a place, as I hope I've emphasized, is really important to how we, uh, how we understand it and how architecture kind of draws from that. So the mountain bike capital of the country is in Bentonville, Arkansas. We had a chance to do a 200,000 square foot office building working with WeWork, their first ground up building, and their architecture department headed by Michelle Rochkin, uh, the, the well-known Mexican architect and his team, Christian Callahan, uh, uh, Haruka Hirochi, uh, James Slade, and others uh, were working together as a design collaboration to develop a, an office building, uh, the first bikeable office building in the country. So you, could, you can literally bike up the facade uh, and take your bike up to the, uh, you know, your fifth floor office. And so it basically is a, an exercise in extending public space diagonally up onto plazas, terraces up above, that are activated by program. So it's still a co-op uh, office space. It's no longer WeWork. Everybody knows what happened, and it kind of imploded. 
uh, and uh, now it's Michelle and uh, Christian and Ruka on their own, but we're working together uh, to get this uh, realized. Uh, and what I love about it, too, on the outside, it inscribes itself in one way to create a kind of scaled back vertical facade from the street. Uh, on the inside, the exteriority of that activity inscribes itself on the interiority here and really creates some wonderful interfaces between the co-op offices and the mobility of the biking and walking that will take place along the ramps. And we're really, uh, really quite, uh, quite excited about this. And it is under construction uh, at the moment, and so it's uh, so slowly coming together. Uh, just to get a little hint. And we're working with Stefan Sagmeister on the ramps, who's designing, uh, graphic designing the ramps. I won't tell you too much other than just think of Ar Ozark creatures in gyms, and it will tell a story uh, that'll be quite fantastic. But this is all uh, scheduled to be completed uh, in September. So uh, again, a, a, a building that extracts you know, from the culture there to become expressive of its place. And an, another building that's on the boards I just want to share with you real quickly uh, before I show you the last project uh, is the whole Health Institute we're working on. This is a building on the Crystal Bridges uh, American Art Museum's campus. This is a, an institute that deals with health, not as a form of treatment, but as preventative health, as well-being, as life management. Uh, and uh, it is uh, really part of the mission of the Crystal Bridges Art Museum, which is about art, nature, and architecture, that synthesis. Uh, and so this is a building that, uh, our first really curved building that wraps around an existing ravine. It's part of a series of trails. Uh, you actually, it's very porous. You move underneath it and through it. It's all made of local uh, giraffe stone, field stone that we can find uh, that's layered up as a veneer. So that's the stone base, which really we understand as, you know, a dialogue between the cave and the forest, which is quite uh, important in this part of Arkansas. The upper part is... Uh, pre-weathered brass, we're not using wood, but we're using the warmth of wood just for durability. And then the inside, uh, a whole a CNC uh, a fabricated pecan uh, ceiling that uh, undulates and provides light, uh, as well as a section and a, a kind of warm datum that complements reciprocally with the travertine floor, and then all of the elements that happen in between. Uh, and this is currently under construction and will be completed uh, in early 2024. So it'll be the first institute of its kind, in many ways, uh, in, uh, located in Bentonville, Arkansas. So I wanted to end tonight with a school that we've been working on the last four years. It's been uh, a really great opportunity to test ideas, to synthesize some of these ideas uh, into an educational model. Uh, the woman that you see here, her name is Louise Thaden, and I'm sure you've heard of Amelia Earhart. She was a friend and contemporary of Amelia Earhart. Uh, she was a pioneer in aviation. Uh, it won uh, several cross-country air races, the Bendex Air Race. Uh, she eventually, she grew up in Bentonville. She moved on to California and then finished her career, at, uh, unlikely but true, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Now, she was a barnstormer. She literally learned to fly the plane by flying through barns and stunt plane. That's how she learned about aviation. And so she was the muse for a school uh, that folks in Bentonville had, a, a maker school, a school project-based that was an open school that would be part of the community. Uh, no fences, no exclusivity. Anybody can go to this school. It uh, doesn't matter what you make. If you, uh, it, you, some students pay $500 a year. Some students pay $25,000 a year. They recruited that dean of students from Princeton to become the headmaster. And he invented the curriculum as we are designing the building. So what you see in many ways is a manifestation of conversations uh, in the making of that curriculum. But there are three signature programs, wheels, reels, and meals. So each student is given a bicycle. It's part of the school. They learn how to fabricate bikes. They learn how to fix them. They learn about biking culture, as I kind of referenced the very strong in Bentonville and the, and the region. Uh, reels, they learn how to tell stories using animation and film. In fact, this is 6th through 12th grade. Two years ago, they had two teams. Their first year were finalists in the AIA Film Challenge. So they're doing something right there. Uh, and then meals. They learn how to grow food, how to produce food, how to harvest the food, how to prepare it and cook it. Uh, and uh, that's a big part of their curriculum, along with uh, uh, theater and, and music. And so 
Uh, it's, this is a space, it's 30 acres, about eight blocks from the town square. It used to be the old fairgrounds. It's not urban, it's what we call urban pastoral. Uh, and it, really our inspirations came from looking at things like chicken houses and farm groupings and these old vernacular barns as a way to master plan uh, the entire site. Uh, really creating a grain that runs east-west, which is really about solar orientation, and then on the corners creating voids uh, that allow the openness uh, uh, of this, the, the uh, campus to be continuous, uh, right, with uh, the home building in the lower right, which has the dining room, the teaching kitchens, and then in the upper left, uh, the, uh, the th theater building, what we call Thetan Performance. And then on the east side of the campus, uh, amongst a bike pump track and soccer field, is the Thetan Bike Barn. So this is a rendering of uh, the manifestation three-dimensional uh, form that came out of that. We're working with S.Q. Dumez Ripple out of New Orleans, as well as Andrew Pogon, landscape architect. So in the master plan, we're really thinking about how the spaces between the buildings are, are activated for education and learning with all types of landscapes, uh, as well as the opportunity for students to crisscross and move uh, in the, in, across the landscape. Um, First building I'll to talk about real quick is the Reels building. Uh, so this building uses our box rib metal system, but with varied panels. Uh, these are very linear buildings. We actually had to bifurcate this one because it was going to be so long. This is a classroom building for for the for the animation and the film and the arts and uh, and the and the administration. Um, and so we're using the pitch and roll here to uh, create uh, uh, sutures, so to speak, uh, into the roof to get light into the middle of the building. Uh, as well as uh, be able to create that dissimilarity and variety in the different uh, program spaces. Uh, one of the things that we made was a, a series of stainless steel, uh, 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 how would you say, uh, stems, so to speak, where uh, screens can be uh, arranged. Uh, there's a sloped lawn out front as part of the Bentonville Film Festival now, so the students can project their films here, but also the community is invited in uh, as well. Now, one of the things we're getting interested in in this customization of color that I talked about with Harvey, uh, we're really getting more inspired. We're going deeper, like lacquer finishes and gold metal flake and things of that nature. And we were inspired by Faye Jones, who used to paint all of his metal uh, with a, a 71 Pontiac uh, saddle bronze, $500 gallon paint, but it lasts 40 years. Uh, so 40 to 50, so it's automobile paint. So that's how we were introduced to it in this chapel, be to a chapel, the inside is all steel uh, using this paint from uh, with this car. And so we're really inspired by how we could develop depth uh, and sparkle and the flip-flop that you get from Metal Flake to uh, uh, extend the life, you know, the UV, uh, but also to create a, a kind of dynamism in the surface. So Dean Jeffries, they probably see on the right, was a real provocateur of this. Uh, who was really known for customized detailing of sports cars and, and race, uh, race cars in the 1950s. Uh, and so we went through a whole uh, series of iterations of looking at different cars. We're working with PPG, who has all of the recipes for every car model in time, uh, what that paint is. And then we are, we're working with Valspar, but now they've been bought by Sherwin-Williams. So they've broadened the access to Metal Flake and the different customized colors and finishes. And so uh, we're working through that. We finally settled on a, the 67 Shelby GT Cobra, the green gold of that. Uh, but we're, what's motivating this too, you have to understand, we have all these indigenous plantings and we want the building to be specific to its place, to be seem like that there's this uh, 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 relationship between what's nature made and culture made. And so we're matching the grasses and that's how we're kind of uh, varying the recipe of the, the metal flake and the shades of the green. Uh, and in the end, it all comes together uh, quite beautifully. Uh, and then again, this is a surface that changes in the light constantly over time, and especially uh, over the course of a day or your, your relationship to it, but really melds with the landscape uh, around it. And you can see the variety in the surface. We cut a cross grain through all of the buildings, the linear buildings. These are breezeways, but outdoor education uh, uh, classrooms, and then punch through those to make these beautiful skylights connection back to the sky. So the earth and the sky are always uh, present uh, in every space. Uh, and the most social space being the hallway, uh, again, the folding of the roof, the suturing to bring natural daylighting in there. So there's no, you don't see any light fixtures or anything. It's all, all daylighting and then 
minor uplighting where we can. And, and you know, using brisolets for control of the sun and sound as it as the building gets nearer to the to the boulevard to the road. This is the student lounge, uh, and you can begin how to see how the folding and movement of the roof adjusts the scale to what's going on in the site. So its cousin, we like to say, is the Wheels Building. And this is a building that's engaging Main Street. It's the bike shop, all the fabrication rooms and all of that. So uh, we were asked to do some sort of physical interface. Uh, and so we developed a porch. It's really a sunscreen from the west, uh, but also creates this great space for them, the bike shop to roll the bikes out and they can work outside. They actually, as part of their community service learning, they, they work on citizens' bikes on Saturday mornings. And along its south side are the productive landscapes, uh, which were the, the different types of vegetables and food are grown and then uh, uh, harvested. And that's actually what's served during lunch, which is a great place to go for lunch, I might add, uh, in this place. Pretty good. And then every space is used, even in the circulation spaces or project uh, collaboration rooms, vitrines made, columns uh, to light that up. And so you can begin to see how that interface works here uh, with the, the big folding door and the bike shop uh, that they, they can move in and out of. Seeing beyond uh, here is the Thaden Performance. This is a building I know uh, John uh, Oschendorf will appreciate this. They actually designed while at the academy. Uh, I had no project. I asked John when I was invited to come as a fellow, well, what do I do? I, what, what's my project? And he goes, well, you don't really have one. He said, you're kind of like... Uh, uh, you know, Samuel Jackson in Pulp Fiction, you're just going to walk the earth, and I might come with you a couple times and uh, yeah, see, see, you know, soak up Rome, so to speak. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so uh, I was in Rome in a studio, and I was working with Charcoal Blue, their designer, was in London uh, on the theater, and he flew over, and we spent two days in my studio drawing. Uh, and out of that effort to develop what this could be on this corner, uh, we came up with this 300 foot long loggia that provides an urban edge uh, to the sidewalk for everybody from skateboarders to bikers to pedestrians, uh, but also creates a strong urban edge uh, as well as a, a wonderful inverted sort of public plaza on the corner. It's all the yellow trace. So we covered the whole studio, just drawing, working through this, uh, and came upon the, a scheme right before he needed to leave. But this loggia really came out of just being in Rome and seeing uh, what could happen through uh, these sort of uh, you know, public, uh, public ways. Um, and, and, and then there's just the landscape taking form in the, uh, in the public plaza. There is no uh, lobby for the building. The, actually, the porch is the lobby. It's the teaching institution. And so, but as you transition inward, uh, has a, you know, a series of uh, spaces for practice uh, of music and drama, and then this kind of, you slide into this entry into uh, the theater itself. Uh, and again, we're working uh, the same idea we had before of how to tile and, and how to develop the right color. In this case, it's more of a gold uh, green. We're working with a, uh, a 71 uh, Camaro uh, and, and a Pacer gold. Uh, so that became the, the, the sort of paint we're using here. And then white with gold metal flake, inverting that. The rake of the building is actually the rake of the uh, auditorium inside, as you can see here. 300-seat uh, auditorium, a stage that's level with the ground. Stage sets are made in the, the wheels building and then brought seamlessly into the back of the house onto the stage. Here, all local white oak uh, plywood uh, folded for acoustics. Uh, you'll see a window here. Uh, we really thought it's important to be able to bring light into the space, even for performance, and have a way to kind of shut that off. The inspiration, too, also came from being in Rome, the Quattro Coronati. They're a small chapel there, uh, the, the St. Sylvester Chapel. And it's a very simple window on the outside, but on the inside, I, I noticed how it expanded upward and outward to create, again, a spatial figure that reflected light into the space and really was the sole source of light, uh, natural light, for this, this chapel. So we wanted to take that on as how to make a figural move uh, in this sort of planar uh, environment, and, but also to extend that figure to the outside. So something that is smooth and, and rounded uh, on the inside, hand plastered, and something much more machine made uh, uh, on the outside. So a series of drawings and 3D modeling and details uh, that begin to describe uh, these series of layers to create uh, this volumetric figure, the one kind of uh, uh, star, let's say, uh, on this facade. And it came out uh, quite beautifully here. And then again, the light, it's really a 
uh, a light reflector more than anything on the inside. You can begin to see how that all comes together and then makes this beautiful backdrop uh, in, the, in the campus itself. So the last component of this is the bike barn itself. They are the barnstormers. Uh, you know, they wanted a real barn. And so I, I meant like a barn that breathes through its skin. So it's naturally ventilated. Uh, we've been working on this barn for about 30 years, is what I told the client. Uh, we just looked at the natural, the old Ozark vernacular barns, but then began to uh, reconfigure, recontour the barn to accept our program and the way it's more specific uh, to like facing west and, and ventilation and that sort of thing. And there it is located on the campus here. Uh, nice rainbow, this happens every once in a while. And it's a bike barn, so all of the doors slide open. It's very porous, you can um, you know, move through it with uh, bikes and they also have other types of activities in it right near the pump track uh, here. Uh, the, the dormers that you see up here are actually ventilators, so the air comes in and then acts as a chimney effect to help ventilate uh, everything. It sits in the meadow. Again, the singularity uh, uh, that obviously it's, uh, the precedents are quite clear. But I know everybody talks about mass timber these days. Uh, we didn't have the money for that, so we used a mass of timber. So we just used a local truss manufacturer uh, to gang nail all these trusses together uh, over in Oklahoma. Uh, and so it's a beautiful figure, but that's you know, literally what we did. It made a series of flitch plates uh, and, and makes this uh, beautiful uh, section. Just one unit multiplied, multiple, uh, multiplied uh, it, it many times to make uh, a beautiful system of articulation of structure as well as cladding. We're using copper screen behind the wood boards of the cladding to get, you know, mitigate the insects but still keep it ventilated. And then we had to think about elements too. And we wanted to think in a commonsensical way, something that would not feel store-bought, but actually would feel of the place here, of the thinking uh, and the making. And so this stair and the mezzanine rails, uh, you know, we gave it a lot of thought and tried to think like a farmer would. So we just took two by fours and cut them diagonally in half and flipped them around on the edge and back screwed them. And then there's no waste and that becomes uh, the rails and the, uh, the enclosure uh, for the stair itself. Very just commonsensical stuff, and it takes you up into this uh, beautiful mezzanine loft area, uh, uh, into the trees, so to speak. Uh, and then working with a great lighting designer out of Brooklyn, uh, Taylor Miller, Alex Miller, and they situated the light so as the sun sets, uh, the light slowly come on, and it goes from opaque to translucence, uh, and then ultimately, as the sun sets, transparent and becomes essentially uh, the uh, hood ornament for the school and an icon in the community. And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and I, and just as an effort at some shameless self-promotion, I think there was some mention of the monograph that Nikolai brought up. Uh, this is it, Radical Practice, Princeton Architectural Press. It'll be out at the end of May. And a lot of the projects you just saw, and many that you didn't, will be inside. Okay, so, Brandon, go. Thank you so right. much, Marlon. Yeah. Um, we have just a few moments. Take, take your time, because yeah. we have a few moments while you're thinking of your own questions for tonight. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, we can discuss and celebrate your work. Uh, if you'd like, we can sit down. Uh, um, sure. Uh, what do you want to? Or do you want to? I don't know. What do y'all do here? It's up to you. We can dance but I think a jig too. We might want to go back and look at some stuff. So why okay. don't we just hang well, out I'll here? Just hang so, back, yeah. um, I, I, you know, I was educated in a white painted concrete masonry windowless schoolhouse prison. Like, yeah. I think many of us probably were, or at least hope sympathetically. Um, so I, I quite enjoyed the, your thoughts on, on how we might address education. I'm also um, quite taken by how you operate through series. And education, like hospitality, is often designed through prototypes. And I'm wondering if you're, how your thought, I won't ask you the question whether you're prototyping any of these designs, but yeah. more so, how, how might your design thinking shift 
if knowing that one is amplifying this on magnitude, you know? You mean you, was, is considered to be a prototype? Prototype. Well, for instance, the school that I went to, I thought was uniquely mm -hmm. terrible until yeah. I saw the exact same school in Georgia as yes. well, and yes. realizing yes. that, okay, yeah. well, this yeah. is just repeated everywhere. Right. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if many other students could enjoy this kind of education? Yeah, but I think that should be done by other architects and such. I, 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 I know this is a cliche, and you, it, I sound like I'm talking in the 90s, but the resistance to commodification is not a bad thing. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, what we're doing uh, would be different if we did it someplace else. Uh, so uh, there is a degree of specificity, although we have done prototypes, projects that are in search of a site uh, as well that are a bit more transient, right? Uh, we, did a, uh, a prototype for a post-Katrina house that was built in Biloxi that could be repeated. Uh, but that's done, uh, I think, perhaps in a different way. Uh, in these types of projects, they're a bit more bespoke. They're trying to uh, create a very particular identity and manifestation of uh, an ethos, let's say, at that school. So it might be different elsewhere. I know when we did the Fayetteville High School, it looks very different, but has some of the similar uh, uh, strategic kind of principles, mm -hmm. you know, involved. But it really just depends on the uh, the situation that we're dealing with. So, uh, it, I think it would be great if you, it was the, what was prototyped were the principles and the ethos, and then let folks design from that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did notice you were thinking specifically about, for instance, the pitch and roll mm -hmm. in in uh, yeah. the the more recent project yeah. and. Yeah. Um, th those methods seem, e even though all of your work is quite unique, there are certain methods and ethos that transcend them. And maybe because you're, you're talking about um, thinking through site specificity, you, yeah. you had some very eloquent words at the beginning talking about um, an understanding of abstraction as a way of better understanding place. I think, I think those were mm -hmm. the words you used. As a way to connect, yes as a way to connect to place. And um, I couldn't help but also notice that there's, you know, if we use two other words in that context of contextualization and juxtaposition, because mm -hmm. it seems that you're doing two things. You're, you're generating new ideas of place that resonate with the foundations and with the history and an understanding of that kind of like distilled, if we think of the barn, like you, yeah. you have the barn, is clearly there's a memory and there's a distilling of that. So um, that barn certainly, s s you know, it, it, it's unique in yeah. that it is standing out. It, right. it is alerting itself. Uh, the same could be said of the WTF clinic, if that's yeah. the canonical term of that building. But yeah. um, I get that, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on um, contextual design, and mm -hmm. then this juxtaposition. Sure. Well, uh, hmm. I, I think uh, in, in many ways that the juxtaposition suggests that it's something done you know, discreetly in complete opposition to what's there. And that contextual suggests the other side of the coin, that it is completely immersed. Uh, we're looking for something that falls in between, right? And so uh, I think about the quote by uh, Elvis Costello. He's, he said that, you know, what I'm trying to do is be an irritant. And I just want to be an irritant, just something that reminds people that everything is not okay, right? So the idea that the contextual is okay or the juxtaposition is okay, we're trying to find that in-between condition. Uh, I used to call this lecture building between. Right, kind of open-ended, but you know, what happens, and so that's that productive tension. It has to be productive, that's what we're after, is a tension between, you know, that contextual perhaps and that juxtaposition. I saw it the singular and the universal, but wh whatever we want to call it, right, and, and, and then uh, allow that to gain its, you know, uh, how would you say, it's esprit de corps kind of deal, it's spirit of being from that relationship, right? Rather, rather than siding one way or the other. It's also a great way, I think, to be more inclusive in your inspirations. It's a great way to not, uh, say, sneer at the context on one hand, or to be 
infatuated just with the novel, right? It, it, it demands, I think, a bit, uh, a bit what I like, you know, uh, I'm thinking of sort of pragmatism in the spirit, spirit, uh, in the, uh, spirit of William James, you know, where you're really weighing, uh, you know, the kind of empirical, the consequences of what those decisions around uh, that you would be making towards design, right? So how, are, how is it useful? How, what, do, what is the impact? You know, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a bit more, uh, oh, I don't know, reflective mm -hmm. in some ways, rather than sometimes what you're talking, contextual or juxtaposition is often reactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we a can also... A uh, answer to your question. This is what I, we're here for, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> no one came here yeah. to listen to me, first yeah, of all. Okay. Yeah, um, but I think, I think we can also very clearly see that intentional balance that you're working on when you're um, exercising certain ideas, when you're serializing the, the characters of, yeah. the, of the, uh, the project in Memphis, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and I, I guess that, that brings me to another question about yeah. disciplinary bounds um, and exactly how you embrace, because I think if, if we look at this work, we know it's, it's through the lens of architecture that a lot of the the discourse is surrounding it. Like we can clearly see the projection and we can see things operating on the oblique. Um, but it was really great to see you share your uh, passion for what I might classify as graphic design and an understanding of totems and uh, identity through singular understandings. And we can see that in the barn project, the, that one elevation is just so clearly identifiable um, and it builds an identity for the school. But through your architecture, it also transforms as one moves around the space. And I'll say, I, I've had the great fortune of visiting many of these projects. And yeah. as you move down into the detail, you're talking about the, the custom paint, the, mm. the texture, the acoustics. That um, What I'd like to know is exactly what disciplines you find yourself associated with at the origins of a project. Like, what kinds of ideas need to exist at the beginning? You mean the sources of inspiration? If we or? list, you know, as we think of disciplines of architecture, interior design, ah. we're talking about product design, graphic yeah. design, color theory. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's all that. I mean, you know, I just think of architecture as a kind of gumbo, in a way. And and what you have to make to make a great gumbo is a great roux, right? So there are essential ingredients, right, that in Laos that are stable somewhat at its center. And then you can be a bit more wild at the edges, the different mm -hmm. types of things that you throw in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we like to front end a lot of things. I mean, uh, material is one of those. Uh, and material uh, comes with material logics. So how materials basically allow for a reading of space and form is really important. And we tend to uh, start thinking about that, you know, pretty early. I think the detail in a more inductive way, uh, uh, rather than reductive, how it's used to uh, work from the specific to general. There have been details we've used to generate a project. Uh, and those details uh, uh, are really important uh, as a means of resoluteness in a project. We're not satisfied with the diagram, and I constantly am teaching that you know, with my students, that they shouldn't be satisfied with the diagram. Uh, the world has made the I think a high degree of the impoverishment uh, of the built environment uh, can be that it's overly diagrammatic at one level and overly irresolute at another. And in other words, there's the way in which resoluteness happens between interscalar conditions, the city uh, form and the elements, uh, right, has to be resonant. And when that's out of resonance, it becomes dissonance and it becomes, it just doesn't work. And so you're just left with a diagram. So I don't think the diagram is good enough. Uh, I think it can be strong, but then how does the reading change from 1,000 feet away to 100 feet away to 10 feet away? And there was architecture, and I won't mention architects or names here, but I being, having survived the 80s, um, mm -hmm. that I can think of where there was no more information 1,000 feet away than there was 10 feet away. Uh, in fact, there was actually less information. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was totally unsatisfying as an architectural experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that's very clear in uh, much of the work you're showing can be appreciated 
from the freeway, yeah. but then new things become explored. You, you, you show the, the, um, the little concrete step outside of the exit door, like l little, little hints and there's a bit of, of humor that you're, yeah. you're discovering things along the way. Right. I, I'm wondering uh, specifically for uh, many of us as students of design, how you begin to think about speed and distance, if that, mm -hmm. if that becomes so critical to a lot of the design decisions, uh, things that exist six feet away from you are very different from uh, six miles away from you as right. you first encounter these projects. Right. So uh, when you're at your desk thinking through these, how, how, do, you, how do you evaluate speed and distance and, and making sure that the project lives in all of that, in that full spectrum? I don't know. I don't... <laughs> uh, sometimes you get lucky, right? Uh, you think about it. I, th I draw, so I mean, that's, that's what I do. I try to, whatever I'm visualizing up here, I try to draw it. So you might see on my, uh, my drawing, you know, something that is like a drone, you know, understanding it as if I were a drone versus something understanding as if I was a worm, you know, bird or a worm or, you know, whatever. And then something eye level and then something diagrammatic, you know, almost analytical. So I'm kind of moving back and forth. Uh, it's a, you're kind of construing, right, uh, the ideas through the way in which you visualize. Yeah. Okay, so to that, it, let me ask one last question before yeah. we pass it to the audience, yeah. is that this constant motion you have, you're, you're talking about wanting to live in a balanced um, state. Uh, we were talking about context and juxtaposition, and you're constantly moving around, zooming in, zooming out. These are mm -hmm. things that we understand as architects. Um, but when you're getting into the kind of character development, the idea that you simultaneously develop uh, a family of characters that resonate somehow with each other but are distinctly unique from each other at the mm -hmm. same time. Do you find that to actually be able to help you break out of the, the singularity of a diagram and to think about it as more of a meta diagram? Like, what, what is the mission here? Is that these things need to have a conversation? I, I absolutely love that project in Memphis. The Memphis. So, so well, straightforward. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean you, you hit on it. This, you know, it's, the, it's the dialogue, right? It's also the dialogue with the landscape or the edges, where, the, again, the field and the edges. So where nature's most interesting is in that ecotone where you know, at the edge of a field or the edge of the forest. So those edges are really important. And, and so that's where porches and things like that, they create these extensions of the building, this overlap. Uh, and so that, uh, that becomes uh, really fantastic. So if you notice, all of those buildings have a porch language. They have their own typological kind of condition that is shared, right? Uh, and yet at the same time, they, whatever the program is, they're starting to respond to that as well. So that course gives them, <coughs> I think, their own individuality. But you know, there's just a bunch of, a bunch of cousins, essentially. <laughs> and we call, I mean, I, I, I hate to bring this up, but, but I mean, the, the two green buildings were, are known as double first cousins, right? And <coughs> if you're from Arkansas, you know what that means. Um, you know what that means? Get, get, I, I think, for the sake of half of the audience, why don't we explain <coughs> the double first That's when a brother and sister marry another brother and sister from another family. So the offspring are double first cousins, right? So anyways, it's so close. It's so close, these buildings, <laughs> that uh, you, you, know, you just kind of think they came from the same place. It's but not quite. Yeah. <laughs> well, on, on that note, why don't we pass this to <laughs> Mackenzie and Ellen, yeah. uh, who have some questions from the audience. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for sure. this wonderful lecture you gave us tonight. Also, feel free to take a seat. Oh, you're going to seat if you too? want to. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I've been standing. I'll oh. keep standing. So All right. I'll stand All right. Over here, though. Yes, we want to leave as much time to, for the audience to ask questions. I think um, I would like to ask a question to kind of start off the um, the entire Q and A tonight, and it speaks to your childhood experience of you know growing up in. Fürstenfeldbruck in Germany, and then moving yeah. from multiple Air Force bases around the country, but also other countries. How did this experience of moving from place to place kind of shape the way you prioritize, but also take care in certain topics in your architectural approach? Yeah. Um, I think it 
produced in me a certain amount of agility, ability to adapt to different situations, different contexts, right? Uh, because you're somewhat nomadic, right? So I was constantly having new friends or new relationships or a new climate to deal with, uh, all of that. So I think it, it, it really helped to pivot, right? Uh, the downside of this is I didn't get too attached to things either. So commitment, uh, you know, dedication certain, to certain a singular focus is very, was very difficult, especially in school. Wasn't the greatest student, uh, but um, Don't say not, that for the, too not for being lazy, just for being, uh, you know, distracted a lot by a host of other things. Um, so I mean, so that that I think was really good. The thing, though, that uh, I came to terms with. Uh, as I started teaching, was realizing that I had never been a citizen of a place. I never lived in a place. Our family never owned a home. You know, we rented. Uh, and even even to go to school, I had to come up with money. So I was a, a Bible salesman for five summers uh, in the rural South just to come up with the cash to do that. So moving around even in the summers, you know. So uh, I learned that I started doing research on architects that I admired and looked at, not just in the States, uh, but I had got to meet a few uh, Swiss architects as well and, uh, and, and artists. And I, what I, what the common theme, even though no matter how different the architecture was, is that they had all found a place to stay, to set down roots, to really become uh, to know. And I, I realized that one of the reasons I liked the architecture of it is because when I visited it, it was a place I wanted to linger in, not just to move through. So much of architecture is sort of designed and thought of, even with the, I talk to students describe their project. Well, you move through this, and move, but they really talk about, well, you, I want you to you dwell right here. You linger here. You take this in. And so that architecture seemed to be emblematic of the commitment to stay as opposed to move. And uh, that I realized when I was starting out in Fayetteville that I needed to stay. If I was going to make architecture, of any real consequence, I needed to stay put. So that's that's how all that worked out. All right, thank you. Yeah. I guess that's also a response to the question of speed that you had before. Oh, um, thanks. Before I ask a question, are there anyone in the? Oh, Paul's got a question. Is that on? Um, I think I've been waiting forty years to ask this question. Um, but why me? <laughs> um, I trans I, because 40 years ago I transitioned from being a high school wrestler to uh, being an architect. So uh, uh, rather than just ask this as an architectural question, I thought I'd ask it as a wrestler okay. question. Um, so you know, in wrestling, there are these techniques we learn. Uh, yeah. You know, double leg takedown, single leg takedown, half Nelson, half Nelson, stand up, fireman's sit carry, out, fireman's carry. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me about your work is that you take certain techniques and you kind of adapt them and you reimagine them and you reinvent them each time you take on a new opponent. So in other words, you go to a different part of the country or you go to a different client and all of a sudden these techniques take on different forms. So rather than sort of inventing a new form for each project that you do, there's this idea that you would just take these techniques that are sort of proven you know, to yeah. be successful and you adapt them. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's one way to overcome uh, a deep knowledge of a place, right? I mean, you, you, you can only understand a place to a certain degree. Like, if I'm asked to do something in Detroit, how can I pretend to know that place really deeply? Uh, I have to have a means of communicating my interpretation of that place, right? Uh, uh, that I uh, have some mastery of, right? So that vocabulary and language, you say techniques, I guess that could be part of it as well, is a way for me to, to voice that. Uh, it's not necessarily true for everyone, but it's certainly what I'm extracting you know, uh, uh, from, from the place and how I'm responding to that. It is both cultural uh, to some extent uh, and also uh, highly physical in what you, you, know, you find what's already there in that particular uh, context. Uh, so it's knowledgeable to a degree, but it, that's how it, how it really, really helps me. And, it, and it's really part of a kind of meta project. I mean, we have our projects in the office, uh, but I, I'm not afraid to reuse ideas uh, over and over because I want to I, I understand the ideas deeply, right? That to just do a one-off 
And so if there is, if it becomes a kind of technique, it's because I'm trying to see the multiple ways that idea could be employed in a positive and constructive way in a different situation. So it's part of a larger sort of uh, project in the, in, in the deal. So it doesn't matter where we're at. It doesn't mean that it's always going to look the same. It just means that there, as you were saying, is an adaptability. And part of the, I uh, hopefully, uh, the intelligence of the, these uh, techniques or ways of working is, is that uh, um, they're not, uh, let me see, I just lost my thought here. Uh, well, is that they do exhibit a certain degree of intelligence in, in their ability to deal with eccentricities or anomalies, uh, you know, that you come into contact with, right? And so that's how, like, if you look at the barn as a type of extrusion, right, a shallow extrusion if, from a scale standpoint, uh, there is a relationship between, say, the mat building that's also working that way, but then has to come up with other ways, right? in which to develop its formal relationships and spatial character that isn't as direct, right, as the, the flat extrusion. So we're constantly trying to see how those, t what are the possibilities and limits for those techniques uh, from a typological standpoint. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's something that we're going to continue to work in because we don't have the answers. But I mean, I was telling, uh, I think, Joe earlier, we know enough to know that we don't know. Uh, and that's a really good place to be sometimes. Yeah, we have time for one more question. I actually have so many, but <clears throat> um, I guess the first one is super simple, and then I'll run the second one by really fast. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, the, the reference to character development seemed really apt because you said you would like cartooning, and I was really taken by the fluidity of your drawing and the video. And then you also were speaking about the anti-diagrammatic um, focus, and so I'm really interested in the role that your drawings play, because it seems like there's such an extemporaneous aspect to your working things out, which as an artist, you know, yeah. I really relate to. So I sort of wanted to hear about that for a quick sec. And then also, um, I, I found so many, being visually oriented, so many quotations in the work which I love as a sort of pastiche. Um, so, you know, the Quonset Hut is the Saarinen and Lincoln Center quote in a way, and the Breuer windows um, seem very, those seem really recurrent to me, but you know, you don't, ref, you don't really refer to historicity in your talk, but um, I feel like that's such a great connector to the vocabulary of architectural history. And yeah. as we were discussing postmodernism earlier, with the way you're incorporating it, it's like post-postmodernism. So yeah. I was yeah. wondering, um, what your thoughts were about that. And then also the um, exteriors sometimes reminded me of dazzle um, camouflage on ships yeah. as they incorporated themselves into the landscape. So those were my well, sort of three discussion points. I, well, I'll take your last one first uh, because that is where we're moving uh, uh, into this notion of uh, camo uh, and camouflage. It, I don't like to use the word biomimicry in a way. I'm just trying to uh, find ways to create a kind of uh, shadow play. And, and, and just like in the metal flake, the flip-flop that you get, if you look at it one way or another, can I get a flip-flop uh, perceptually as I engage a, a work? So we are, we are designing a cabin right now that will be employing a kind of custom camo uh, uh, metal skin, so that's that's kind of the next where we're going. So the boats and stuff, I've looked at those, and yeah, and it's again another form of. So I'm not talking about literal camo. I don't, and in the same way, I'm also not talking about literal cartoons. People get confused. You say I was a cartoonist, and they look at your buildings and go, "Well, that's not a cartoon." I said, "Yeah, that's why I'm not a cartoonist anymore." You know, so the the, the cartooning is 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 a, a quick way to work. Uh, to capture what it is I'm trying to say uh, expressively. But the drawing that I choose is the gesture drawing. And so that's the drawing technique that I mostly use. It's usually either with charcoal or a soft pencil 
This keeps it very liquid and allows me to work through an idea without totally committing to it through this, through this softness, the tonality, let's say. And it also allows me uh, to get away from lines. I, I, I really hate sitting with my students and they pull out a ballpoint pen to draw with it. It drives me crazy, makes me start to twitch and stuff. And I'm like, well, if you use a soft, something soft, you can go from tone or surface to edge. There are no lines in a tonal drawing, right? It's just edges and lines. And you can be able to pull and push, and you can create a whole kind of uh, type of architectural jellyfish, right, in, in terms of how you're working. So it becomes mentally spatial, right? So those are, the, those are why I lean towards those types of, those types of drawings. Uh, and some of them can be constructed, but some of them are just very uh, intuitive, but mostly informed by uh, one's understanding of the program of the place. And then when you embody that knowledge, then you've you got to put something out there. And, and that's how I choose to do it. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Awesome. That answered two out of the three, I think. <laughs> uh, and with that, we'll give it back to Ben. Brandon, you're back. We're done? Yes. Okay. Uh, how about a big round of applause for okay. Marlon? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's great. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. We, we really appreciate this. Um, and thanks go out to our members of the communication team as well in organizing this incredible event. Um, especially Aiden Flynn, Daisy Zhang, Bella Carriker, Nanase Shirakawa, and Amanda Moore. And as we end the event, I would like to also give particular thanks to Kelly and Joe for your dedication to the Arthur H. Shane Memorial Lecture Series, as well as your ongoing commitments and involvements in art and architecture at MIT and beyond. Thank you so much for everything. So I, I have a couple quick announcements. Um, unfortunately, the Tirani Symposium, uh, which is the next event slated on our calendar, uh, is delayed until next fall, I believe. Uh, but please join us for a presentation by Professor Nita Sinokrat in collaboration with the Art, Culture, and Technology Program. That's gonna be on April 28th at 6 p.m. in Long Lounge. And uh, as always, you can check our website for an updated list of our events at architecture.mit.edu. And thank you again for everyone joining us tonight. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Marlon. <laughs> Wonderful.